I'm Bill Doley, President and CEO of Archaeology Southwest, and I want to welcome you all to season 16 of our Archaeology Cafe series. Um, so Archaeology Southwest's uh, headquarters are in Tucson, uh, the homeland of the autumn. And I ask all of our audience to please take a moment and acknowledge the indigenous peoples whose lands you are guests upon this evening. Last year's highly successful theme of avian archaeology for our, our uh, cafe series shared diverse examples of relationships between people and birds. This year's theme focuses on human relationships. Better Together, Research Conceived in Collaboration and Community is the full title of this year's theme. And the idea comes from uh, the central goal of Archaeology Southwest's current strategic plan, which focuses on co-creation and co-engagement with indigenous nations and communities. Collaboration and cooperation are processes of listening and learning that we are committed to advance in our work at Archaeology Southwest. In planning for CAFE season 16, um, we realized we had an opportunity to uh, learn from the experiences of others who are participating and practicing collaborative community-based archaeology. And all of you in our audience will be able to come on, come along on this journey. So we're deeply grateful to the continuing support for our CAFE from the Smith family through the Smith Living Trust. Thanks, Jean and Eldon, and thanks, Jay. And we're eager to learn from the experiences of our amazing uh, lineup of presenters for this season. Tonight's cafe features Davina Two Bears, the archaeologist, and her research partner, Ruth Van Dyke. Davina earned her PhD from Indiana University and today is on the faculty at Swarthmore College. Ruth earned her PhD from University of Arizona and is professor at Binghamton University. <clears throat> State University of New York, and I'm proud to announce a new member of the Board of Archaeology Southwest. Thank you, Ruth. So I thank them for their willingness to speak to us tonight from three time zones away. And let's let them share their stories about Diné archaeology of Chakra Mesa. So take it away, Ruth and Davina, and thank you for your late night performance from the East Eastern time zone. Thank you, Bill. Um, I'm going to kick things off by sharing my screen and firing up our PowerPoint. So someone needs to let me know if this does not work, but we're hoping it does work. Here we go. I'm seeing it. Davina, are you seeing it? Does it look good? Yeah. Okay. So thank you so much, Bill and Linda, for inviting us to present in the Archaeology Cafe. Both Davina and I are really excited to talk about the work that we did in the summer of 2021 on Chakra Mesa in Chaco Canyon. So I'm going to kick things off by kind of just orientation, explaining what this project was and how it came about. And then Davina is going to take it from there and talk about the archaeology. And hopefully we'll just have some good back and forth and conversation. We don't have a scripted talk. We have more of a let's just tell you guys what happened and, uh, and, and how we learned a lot of amazing things from each other and together on Chakra. So I'm assuming that everybody in the audience is familiar with generally where Chaco Canyon is in Northwest New Mexico. And here's your standard park service map of the, the canyon. Um, I don't have a way to do an arrow to show you guys. So I'll just have to describe, you all know, you know the visitor center and kind of the, the central workings of the park and Fajada Butte and all of that. Hopefully you might also be aware that there is a large landform, a big uplift that is called Chakra Mesa that forms essentially the south side of Chaco. It's broken by Fajada Gap and South Gap, but um, the big landform that we call Chakra Mesa is that, that big southern uplift that extends from Fajada Gap and then heads um, east actually for many, many, many miles past the park boundary. And here's another view of the, the same area, Google Earth view. Now, 
you may or may not be aware, you should be aware that there's a tremendous amount of Navajo archaeology in Chaco Canyon. And, and Chaco, Chaco Mesa in particular was a place where a lot of Navajo folks were living and, uh, and, and, and farming and sheep herding for at least since 1600. And there are many, many, many Navajo sites on top of Chaco Mesa and the down in the valley below. We are by no means the first archaeologist to look at this area. In fact, there's been quite a lot of previous research that's been done on the Navajo archaeology inside the boundaries of Chaco Culture National um, Historical Park. And so here's a, a, a list, if you will, of folks that have done work into the Navajo archaeology before we had access to a lot of this as we set about our project. So how did this project come about? Well, the, the National Park Service has a cooperative ecosystem study unit agreement with Binghamton University, which means that basically they um, like to reach out to academic partners to help them do things that otherwise they uh, don't necessarily have the personnel or the time to do. And it provides a good opportunity for researchers such as Davina and I to, to learn and to also train students. So anyway, they had reached out to me because they wanted my help to do some archaeological um, site assessment is what they call it on Chakra Mesa and it basically entails revisiting sites that have been previously recorded and then um, basically trying to see if there's been any sort of adverse effects you know damage from vandalism or elk traffic or things like that over the last um, you know however long it's been since somebody last visited the sites so they reached out to me and asked me if I would do this and you know my first reaction Action was fantastic, Chakra Mesa, you, you, you bet I will. And then I said, send me the list of sites. So he sent me a list of sites. And, and I looked and I said, these are, these are all Navajo sites. And I said, you know, so we're going to do some Navajo archaeology up here. We need to have a Navajo archaeologist. <laughs> and the park was like, oh, yeah, you're right. We should. So I reached out to my, my good friend and colleague, Dr. Davina Two Bears. And I said, you know, the park wants me to do this, but I don't want to do it without a Navajo archaeologist, what do you think? Are you interested? And I think it took Davina one second. <laughs> I don't think I had finished the sentence. And she said, oh, yeah, absolutely. So I brought Davina on as, as basically the co-PI. And then Davina and I, with a group of Binghamton grad students, spent, how long was it, Davina? Like four weeks, six weeks? Yeah, Something like that. Five weeks, I think. Mm -hmm. Until the rain drove us away, and it did. Um, but in the summer of 2021, we originally were going to try to go 2020, I think, in COVID. But anyway, we did it in the summer of 2021, and uh, and we really had a blast. And I learned a tremendous amount because, you know, full disclosure, I didn't know that much about what we were going to find before we went up there, um, despite all of this this previous work, which I think has not always gotten the um, the 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 study or the respect that it probably should have from from Southwest archaeological colleagues. So Davina, I have control of this thing of the PowerPoint thing. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide and pass it over to you. And I guess just tell me next slide when you're ready for me to move on. Okay. okay. So here we go. First site. Okay. Well, I just first want to say thank you um, for. Um, your invitation to speak today and um yat eh shit divina two bears in a shit to the cheat in a shlint touchy knee bushes chain tabahi dash a chedo to the cheat knee dash another city to that nasha um swathmore college did not finish i'm uh originally from northern arizona the bird springs community on the navajo southwest navajo reservation and my clans are bitter water and I'm born for red running into the water and my maternal grandfather is edge water and my paternal grandfather is um, bitter water as well. And I'm very happy to be here in um, uh, the indigenous land of the Tohono O'odham and the, the, the Yaki people of um, Tucson area. Um, uh, my brothers and sisters there. Uh, it's it's an honor to be speaking um, in in this context. So uh, I just um, was very happy when Ruth called me because 
Well, I, I have been in grad school a long time and hadn't been out to do actual survey work in a while. So, and I had never been to this area of the reservation. Um, mostly I'm familiar with the, the Western half of the Navajo reservation. Um, I did work for the Navajo Nation Archaeology Department. So this was a unique experience for me. And one thing that um, I did I um, realized immediately was um, that the evidence of Navajo archaeology in Chaco Canyon is pretty much everywhere. Um, that, that became really apparent right away. And um, I feel really lucky to have been asked and I just, you know, I thought a lot about the fact that um, the Park Service was going to be doing this research on Navajo sites. And um, I'm very thankful that Ruth asked me. And I think I just want to emphasize that it's really important to think about these kinds of projects and reaching out to uh, collaborate with uh, Native Americans, descendants of the sites that you're studying. Um, and I know that that's starting to happen a lot more. And I just really am grateful that um, that that it, that it's happening um, with Chaco Canyon. And and it, thanks to Ruth, you know, for for thinking that, you know, she really wanted to have a Diné person to 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 work on this site. So this this image here is one of the early 20th century um, um, Hogan sites that actually was at the base of a really um, um, great and well-known site, Navajo site that's, I believe this is at the base of the dollhouse site, right, right Ruth? Yeah, I think so, yeah. <laughs> so there were two, um, two similar uh, stone hogans such as this that dated to the early 20th century. And these were the first couple of Hogans that we reassessed. And I, I just, I was amazed at um, the, you know, I ha I'm mostly um, familiar with the um, late or mid 20th century archeology. span So it was really special for me to see a stone Hogan. Um, a lot of the Hogans that I've um, recorded um, on the Western Navajo Reservation. They're usually made of juniper logs. So it was my introduction to um, the, 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 I guess the architecture of um, the Navajo sites here on Chaco, which take advantage of the stone, the natural stone that is everywhere. And um, inside this particular Hogan, there was, there was still plaster um, mud on the insides of the walls. So um, I, I, it, the preservation of these sites is really amazing. And I'm, I, you know, I'm sure that has to do with the park. And it was just interesting to me also to, you know, these, these sites are not very far away from Wajiji. And um, I, I, I'm, I guess I just question, you know, why um, there's no interpretation of Navajo sites, especially a site like this that is a really good example of um, early 20th century Navajo um, Hogans. Um, and this would be a really, you know, a really cool site to visit um, for, for tourists and, and even, you know, for Navajo families to come back and revisit the sites where their ancestors lived. So uh, it was it was really, um, the, these Hogan sites were a really good introduction to our project because they were, we didn't have to hike so far to get to them. And they were just, you know, really beautiful uh, Hogan's that, um, you know, that were made out of um, uh, natural sandstone. And, and across from this Hogan, um, we, we also relocated the corrals. So next slide. And <clears throat> these corrals, um, they also are made out of sandstone and they take advantage of, 
you know, the sandstone that is located everywhere. And this, this is um, the corral that is associated with that Hogan. And again, it's a beautiful, a, a beautiful construction of um, an early 20th century sheep corral, which I have never seen um, this type of sheep corral uh, before made out of sandstone. And they, you know, take advantage of the, the natural sandstone as well that is in abundance, um, the, the boulders. And what was really cool about this site was that there was also rock art that was on the boulders um, uh, within the uh, corral. And so um, I, you know, it was, we found like so much Navajo rock art. I mean, literally they were drawing on every like exposed surface that that had you know good light and and um, um, <laughs> our colleague Max, who studies rock art, was very very good at um, uh, finding the rock art and um, not only the ancient rock art but so much Navajo rock art. Um, I I believe at this particular site there was a, a Navajo rug um, that some that had been scratched into the sandstone like a Navajo rug rug design and <clears throat> so it's just really special for me to be in another part of the Navajo reservation and to see these um, really beautiful sites that are still intact and that are really different from what I've ever encountered before. Um, I've, I had never seen a Navajo uh, corral made out of sandstone. I think we have some um, images of rock art coming up um, pretty soon, but they're not the next slide. So <laughs> here's the next slide, um, which I think now we're going up to the dollhouse, right? Yeah. So uh, um, on top of the um, the mesa above the, the Hogan that you just saw is the dollhouse site. And I, I guess, is this, was that Hogan a part? Of, it's a part of the dollhouse site too, right? So yeah, there were like, there was a cluster of maybe like seven or eight um, Hogan, stone Hogan's on this point. And these are, you know, really defensive dating back to, um, I guess at least, at least 1600 we estimated judging by some of the pottery that we were seeing up there and uh, so Davina you were telling me when we were out there that this would have been a time when um, the Diné were were uh, wary of people that might be you know encroaching on them and menacing them <laughs> from different directions so yeah yeah it, it was really um I I had uh Dave Dave Bruby's uh book um, that he published in, in 1986 that um, my dear professor Deborah Nichols gave to me um, a couple of years ago. Um, um, and she, uh, or I, I was reading this book while we were, well, Ruth had assigned it to us, but I had brought it out and-, and um, We all had copies of it, yeah. <laughs> And I was reading it while we were while we were um, like uh, re-recording all of these places, and he has a, an extensive section on the dollhouse site, and um, he talks about uh, the the pueblito like hogans. So the the hogans on top of the mesa were older, like Ruth said. Um, you know, definitely dating to 1700s. And um, that's what um, D David Ruge said that th this this one pictured um, I, on the far left, I believe was one of the ones that what really looked like a Pueblito. Um, it had uh, little loopholes in the wall where you could see really far distances um, up and down the Chaco, Chaco wash. And um, so these were like the Hogans that we re-recorded that were really in um, defensive um, positions. And you can't tell 
you know, Ruth is in the, in the picture there with a couple of the NPS um, workers. And you can't tell that this site is like literally on the edge of a cliff. <laughs> I mean, you can walk like less than, you know, 10 feet and it, it, the, there, there's a, a drop, like a sheer drop. Um, I got really nervous when I was re-recording -re -re these Hogan sites because they're literally right on the edge of a cliff. So they are definitely def defensive in nature. And also you can see really far, um, uh, they're, they're very, they're, you know, they have really good sight lines. So um, it, it just, it was just um, amazing to me to see that transition, I guess, from like Poblitos of Dineta area that um, were being built also Poblito-like structures in Chaco Canyon. Um, so you can see that connection to the Poblitos of Dineta. Although these one, this this example here wasn't as as large and it didn't have um, uh, associated fork fork stick hogans as as you know, but there were other other hogans, um, several hogans in on top of the dollhouse that that were very old, and you don't find any um, modern trash or debris um, uh, on these hogan sites. You just find um, pieces of uh, pottery, and it was kind of funny because there were these weird walls of sandstone, and we were like, "What are these?" <laughs> but we figured it out. <laughs> yeah, they, you want to tell them? Ruth made it. <laughs> well, right. want to tell them, Ruth? Yeah, Dave, Dave Briggy had excavated these sites, um, or a number of the Hogans actually. And so these were, of course, his rubble piles where he was calculating the volume. But they were these nifty little sort of banquette walls out in front of each of the Hogans. And we were we were looking at the old maps going, these things aren't on there. And we figured out why. So we recorded them. They're almost historic now. <laughs> they will be soon. Yeah, but yeah. People are probably wondering why it's called the dollhouse. Is that the next slide? Let's, let's find out. Nope. Should I go to the dollhouse and come back? What do you think? Okay, let's see. Okay. So this is the actual dollhouse um, for which this giant Hogan complex is named. So yeah. Um, you can see the dollhouse um, in on the left photograph. It's like kind of in the center of the screen. And um it's funny because Max's shadow, I didn't realize, is right on top of the dollhouse. Um, and then, of course, uh, Max is standing there. Um, and we're, he's taking points. Um, I don't know what that device is called, the tablet, but and then yeah, this was part of our mandate. This is Max Fortin, one of my grad students, and uh, he's probably out there. Hi, Max. And uh, one of the things that, of course, they wanted us to do was bring the site locations into compliance with NAT 83. Um, so we had a, a park proprietary system um, with a GPS receiver, and we were talking to satellites when we could reach them and, uh, and, and making sure that all of the sites were, were located correctly. But I don't know if people can really tell, but you can when you can see Max standing next to the structure. Structure is tiny and it's kind of a mystery as to what it's actually for. I mean, Brugge called it the dollhouse because it's like this little mini, mini house, but it's like perfect little sandstone blocks. And wasn't there, there was like perfect little, like, like little twigs for a Vega roof and yeah. there were two potsherds up there, you know, but so we don't know. Little <laughs> and door. I don't think Nobody knows, right? Yeah. yeah, and it was really fun to, we, we were determined to um, find the dollhouse. And- um, well, yeah, because it's hidden. Yeah. It's very, very yeah. hard to see unless you know where to look. Exactly. We can tell other stories about that, which we, we probably shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, it, it was really fun though to work with the grad students and, um, they were very enthusiastic about pinpointing or finding where the dollhouse was, and you know I was um, helping helping by uh, reading through David Brugge's uh, description, 
And just through reading through his description and us brainstorming, we were able to locate where, where locate the dollhouse. So it was really special for us to be able to see this um, tiny, uh, tiny oh, sandstone structure that was built in this little alcove. And, and we don't, I've never seen anything like it. I've never heard anything like um, anything about miniature structures like that in my own Diné culture. So it, it was, um, it was really cool to actually see the dollhouse and also be able to find it. But this whole area um, was just an amazing, it was one of my favorite places because it had these, you know, really old Hogans, Pueblito type, had the dollhouse, and then it had the early uh, 20th century example of Navajo stone Hogans all in this whole area, which would be a wonderful place, I think, to do interpretation of Navajo historical archaeology. Yeah, for sure. Well, here, I'll go back to the one that I zoomed over. Okay. Oh, yes, yeah. Uh oh, previous, previous. Okay. Yeah. So um, I think was this was oh this was up above Shibikashi, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. We're just showing examples of like some of the less well preserved Hogan rings. Yeah. For this, I just wanted to emphasize that you know this Navajo Hogan Hogan ring. Um, it's almost like a double Hogan, but you can't really see it. There were many examples of double Hogans um, on this, this um, survey, and they were usually very, the older Hogans, probably dating to the 1700s. And I've never seen a double Hogan, um, a really old, well, first of all, like I said, I haven't really, seen old hogans before but i had never really seen old double hogans and it was um there were many double hogans that were being built um in, in, during the 1700s in chaco canyon and what was interesting to me what i kept seeing over and over again was that they were in such close proximity to these large ancient ancient sites like shibikasi it wasn't too far away from this, this double Hogan wasn't too far away from, from that large. Um, uh, Ruth, what, what, what time period is Shibikasi site? That's a big basket maker three site. So 450 to 700 or so um, of the common era. Yeah. So that's all I wanted to say about this slide. And there's a couple of, uh, of the, our, the graduate students there, Liv Winicky and uh, Catherine Peterson with Davina. All right, I'm gonna zoom to rock art. So yeah, we had this um, grad student, as I mentioned before, Max Fortin. Some of you probably know him. He's really active in Tucson and Ark and Hiss and rock art is his passion, right? And so as Davina was saying earlier, he was really good at finding it and we, when these sites had been initially recorded, people frequently obviously noticed the big rock art panels. Um, so, you know, it's not like nobody had recorded any of them before. And Jane um, Colber and Donnie Yoder, have, of course, have been down there doing a lot of rock art. But Max is so good at finding it. On average, wouldn't you say, Davina, like a site form would say there were two or three panels. And by the time Max got through looking, there were like 25. Yeah. <laughs> And and a lot of it was Navajo rock art. Most of it was Navajo rock art, right? Yep. So, um, yeah. This this particular panel was um, there was a the site. You can see the numbers there on the slide, but it was tucked away. Um, it was on Charca Mesa. And you had to to hike farther on Charca Mesa to get to it, and it was um, in this like little alcove area and um, of sandstone and the I guess it would it would be I think very protected in the winter time from like winds the hogan that would have been there there was there is no hogan there now we could see the where the hogan probably was but um, along the there's this 
you know, sandstone all around the Hogan, like an alcove and like um, directly behind the Hogan, all, all along that wall was just so much rock art, Navajo rock art. So I took a few pictures of, um, you know, the, some of the rock art and you could see the, um, I'm, I'm not sure what figure this is or, you know, what, what, um, what deity it is, Navajo deity or ho holy person it's referring to. But um, I thought it was just, you know, a beautiful um, representation. And then you, you can see the corn stalk on in the middle side. Um, and and the, it reminds me of some of the pictures of rock art in Dineta. Um, so there's that, you know, connection there. And um, there's a lot of um, um, livestock that 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 was drawn. Um, I didn't actually put a picture of horses, but there was a lot of horse rock art that um, was that we encountered. So much horse rock art, and but on the the left screen, it looks like there's a bull you can see that was scratched into the sandstone. So it was just so amazing to just just look at you know this this panel and just think of i wonder you know who who did it and you know how what were they thinking and you know um it was just uh just amazing to look at all the different the different art art or the the rock art all the different things that they were creating um uh all along the sandstone all behind where um, the hogan would have been yeah, I don't know if people can see my pointer or not. Can you see my pointer moving there? I can. Show... Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, I was trying to show folks what you're what you're describing. Oh, okay. This is a fun one. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Look at that smile on your face, Davina. <laughs> we were we were re-recording. We were in the ash pile, right, of one of the hogans, and we were re-recording. And uh, yeah, look at what we found. <laughs> Yeah, and believe it or not, I, I mean, I I work for the Navajo Nation Archaeology Department for 14 years, uh, a total of 14 years, and I had never found a uh, projectile point. <laughs> I had found like pieces of projectile points. I I found drills, but I never actually found a a full projectile point until I worked on Charca Mesa. And so this is the beautiful point. I just like, I, I saw it sticking out of the ash pile and I was just like, oh my God. And then Ruth, you asked your friend to look at it and- Yeah, the beauty of modern technology. I snapped a quick uh, photo and went up on a high place and texted it to uh, Bonnie Pitvlato, a paleo Indian expert. And I said, is this what we think it is? And she wrote back and said, why, yes, it is. And she also told it was what it was called. Oh, but now I don't remember. Do you remember? Yeah. Uh-oh, <laughs> somebody's going to chime into the chat and remind us. But yeah, yeah totally- <laughs> Awesome paleo point, or maybe possibly a knife, but we're going with point. <laughs> so, yeah, so she did beautiful. say. I think it 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 was. It's a very old. Um, it it's a very old um, point. So I was so excited to be, you know, to have found such an old um, projectile point, and then. I also found an abrader, which I, in the same ash pile, it was just, you know, sitting right on top again. And um, it was just an amazing sight. I think this, this there were so many, you know, cool things um, at this site. And it, I would, I just, but it made me think, I was just thinking, um, why, why, why was, why were these tools, I, in the ash pile is i you know they see i mean the the projectile point is beautiful and you know i i, ju I just didn't understand why it, it would be in an ash pile um uh as well as the abrader um but yeah so the site was very cool 
Yeah, so um, this is leading up to, I think, one of the other cool things at that site. There, there were a couple of sites that we recorded towards the end of our project um, that were really high up. Like if you look at Chakra Mesa and you see the cliffs and you think, oh, that's high. Well, we had to climb that and then walk a long way and then climb another set of cliffs uh, to get to a couple of the, the last sites, which were very large and which had been previously recorded by the Chaco Editions project in the early 1980s. And so there's a beautiful example of this bread oven at one of them. And I'm showing you guys this partly um, so you'll have a better idea of what this bread oven would have originally looked like. And I, I gotta say here, it just really, it, it was really meaningful for me um, to be walking the footsteps of my archeological mentors. You know, they, these people who lived here were not my ancestors as Davina was experiencing, but I was in the footsteps of Gwen Vivian, um, who was my PhD advisor, and uh, Bob Powers, a very good friend, uh, and Barbara Mills, of course, uh, also on my PhD committee and great mentor. And so back in the early 80s, um, Bob and Barbara had been part of the group that had been out recording these very same sites, and we were using their maps to relocate things. And I was sitting recording this bread oven at one of the sites, and one of my students was looking through the, the, the site materials that we had from the park, and she noticed, oh, there's another picture of somebody doing exactly that. And I looked, and it was Barbara Mills in 1984. So the students arranged me. They tried to pose me in exactly the same way, and somebody like lent me a bandana because I was wearing a bigger hat because we wear bigger hats now. I'm sure Barbara does too. But uh, anyway, uh, and they got me all posed just right and, and tried to take the picture. Uh, and really, amazingly, very little had, had changed at this site um, in terms of the archaeology. But what you will notice is there's a pretty serious pinyon die-off going on on Chakra, um, the pinyon tree that was very vibrant there. What in 1984 today is 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 no longer, but anyway. So this was this was meaningful uh, the, to to me to to get to do this. Should I keep going? Let's see, ah, pottery. We got to show them some Navajo pottery. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think most of most of the Hogan sites, um, they. One of the main things that we found at the Hogan sites was Navajo pottery. So this is again something that I didn't really experience in doing archaeological surveys on the Western Navajo Reservation is finding a lot of Navajo pottery. So we were um, I was able to find a lot of Navajo pottery. But it's interesting though that some of the, some of the sites were pretty bare because I think the artifacts had been collected by previous surveys. So we, like a lot of the Hogans, would be really cleaned out. And um, it's because they, they had already been, you know, surveyed and artifacts collected um, at, at these different Hogan sites. But there were, there were many examples. And I really like the, the, this, these shirts that I'm holding because you can see the scrape marks um, on, on these shirts, especially on the outside shirt. So um, I, I, those two pictures on the right are um, of the same shirt um, outside and inside. And then we also saw some Pueblo uh, tradeware pottery um, examples of those. Unfortunately, I, I, I'm so mad that I didn't take pictures of those. Oh. I have pictures we could oh well we yeah. also found this is really weird but we also found part of a perforated plate I confirmed this with Patrick Lyons um, and we don't know what that was doing there so there's some interesting research questions here potentially for the future yeah I'll keep going you know what it's it's 20 of um of 10 for us so I, I guess we need wow. to get to the really good stuff that's at the end so <laughs> let's see so um I guess I'll just briefly say that this, um, I wanted to show this partly because this was really cool. We kept walking over these concentrations of firecracked rock and um, we, we saw that there was something there, right? But we weren't entirely sure how to interpret it until, I don't know, after we'd seen two or three of these, it's like our eyes were tuned and we realized there was a little like roasting oven in the middle. And if you guys can see my arrow, actually there's some flags. There's a little, um, there's a little rectangular, sub-rectangular, pit there and then there's this massive scatter of firecrack rock and we we're always finding these bipinion trees 
And, you know, Davina figured it out. You know what they were doing, right? <laughs> Davina, you told me how your grandmother used to roast the pignon, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, you know, that's um, over, over um, an open fire. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just guessing, you know, there, there's a lot of things that the Navajo people, our traditional foods, we roast, um, we roast corn in the ground, um, you know, pinions, we also roast before we eat them. And um, we also, um, but, you know, I've never seen like a, a site like this again, that, 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 that there's so much fire crack rock um, at, at this site and, and also a, a pit. It was used for a long time, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this, this, this was really um, special. I got to record this amazing uh, rock art panel. Um, you can see the picture there that uh, Randy McGuire and I, we spent like a whole day just recording this uh, rock art panel. It had been uh, drawn before, but the drawings were, didn't include all of the detail or all, all, all of the um, rock art. So we really worked hard to include uh, everything that we saw. And like I said, it took us, it took us all day and we were, it was so hot out there. <laughs> City. Yeah, there's. I don't know. We have a. We don't have a picture, but at one point they had a big umbrella. Yeah, <laughs> they had brought in. I think Tanachai Bruins, a um, park archaeologist, had brought this big umbrella for us, and Davina was under it. Yeah, so, but was it, it was an, an amazing experience. Now I, you know, I'm not a traditional. I mean, I don't know a lot about the Navajo religion and traditional religion. Uh, interpretations of what what this um, this signifies, but I even if I did, I probably wouldn't really be able. I probably shouldn't be talking about it. <laughs> you know, sacred knowledge. So, but in any event, it was a great experience to record that. And this site was a really emotional site for me, just because it was a beautiful Navajo home site. There are a couple of beautiful stone hogans that you see here. And um, there's this, the red hand site where um, um, there was a huge uh, corral um, at the base of this um, sandstone alcove again, uh, and all these red hands. And what I found out during this project was that many of these people that lived here were my clan, they were touching me clan. So that's my father's side. And when I found that out, I, it just, it made me um, sad, but it also made me happy because I was thinking that I'm able to, I'm, I'm a relative to the people that lived here they were you know closely related to me but also I was sad because my people my family my relatives clan relatives were removed from Chaco they left this beautiful home site forced they were they didn't leave they were forced to leave and it was very emotional for me to see this beautiful place, to know that my clan relatives lived here and they were forced to leave when Chaco became a park, a national park. And that happens a lot to indigenous people um, when national parks are created. And when the, the Red Hands, um, they, I was told once that when our people came back from Fort Sumner, um, where we were imprisoned for four years by the U.S. government, um, we we put our handprints um, when we came home to our home place, red in red paint, and we put our handprints. So I, you know, I I, I was told that by um, one of my Navajo uh, archaeology colleagues. And this was the first time I ever saw that. And it was really emotional for me to see that, you know, this Navajo family that was probably here for generations 
when they came back from Fort Sumner, you know, they they put their families' handprints and there were big handprints and there were baby handprints up there. So it was a very special site. The one, the last one that we were, um, re we recorded and it was a really beautiful one. And I feel really lucky to have been able to go there, but also sad because those are my relatives that that were forcefully removed from their homes. Yeah, I felt really privileged to be there with you, Davina. Um, you had told us that story about the, the handprints, I don't know, maybe a week or two before, um, before we ever saw this site. And I remember that morning when we walked up into the site and and we we walked past the the standing hogans and then we walked to the back and we saw these handprints and I think we were all crying <laughs> because it was just such a such an emotional moment and it was just so clear that you know this was this was a a family who lived here and this was a very special place for them for a long time and then as you said they were they were removed from here in in the 1950s so that the park could be empty <laughs> yeah and you know um what, what one of the the Navajo people that um work at Chaco he said to me you know he's he was he said it's good I'm really happy to see one of our own you know here because I think he was thinking about how most of the archaeologists that he sees that come to work at Chaco are non-Navajo so he was really happy to see a Navajo person working on this project. And, you know, a lot of those, the, the people that work at Chaco, the Navajo people are from, from there and they're, they're the families that got removed. So I think we're running out of time, so. I'll... I think we just have a couple more though. I think we wanted to show people the um, amazing, well, corral from that same site. And then in front of the corral was this, this piece of wood with these hollowed out spaces that I think was labeled a sheep trough, but um, Wade Campbell knew what it was. Did you know what it was for Davina also? Or was that Wade who told us? Yeah, I think um, it was Wade. Yeah, because of course this is what he studies. <laughs> Wade, if you're out there, hello. Uh, and um, so this could be to hold salt for the sheep, but it was pretty ingenious and it was still there uh, in front of the corral probably after some, what would this be, 70 years. So I, I think this is our very last adventure slide. Uh, as, we, as we alluded to earlier, we were in Chaco, we were on Chakra until the rain forced us out in July. And we had many exciting adventures because the road is on the opposite side of the Chaco Wash from the Mesa uh, where the archeology span was. And so every day we had to cross the dry Chaco Wash until one day it wasn't dry. And then a few days later it was really not dry like we couldn't cross it and the park built us this sketchy bridge thank you park um and, but the problem i mean where you see davina and max crossing it in the morning the problem with this particular day as i recall davina i think this was one of our last days right we came back about eight hours later that bridge wasn't there because it had been washed away and then we had a problem so we went on a couple of death marches there were some sketchy things we had to do to get back from the field but uh, we decided to save those stories for another day i think right so um so i think yeah so um i mean we both just really want to thank so many people who participated in this work or who made this work possible but i mean most of all davina i just want to thank you for sharing your knowledge with me and your friendship i had an amazing time and i learned a tremendous amount and you know i think we're not done working together i hope yeah well thank you too ruth for for inviting me and um I, I had an amazing time as well. And I, I, I want to go back so bad. We will <laughs> one way or another, I think. Yeah. So, um, is there anything else you wanted to, to say Davina? Um, or should we let people ask questions? Yeah. Hey, Linda. All right. Well, um, do you want to stop sharing your screen or do you want to keep sharing? Does um, it matter? Yeah. <laughs> but um, thank you so much. That's been so fascinating for telling oh, us the story a little oh, bit right. here, yeah. you know? 
Okay. Um, yeah. And so, yes, for folk out there, you know how this works. Um, put your questions in the Q&A and I will try to curate some questions for um, Ruth and Davina here in the 10 minutes or so we have left. I promise them because it's so late at night, we're not going to go late. So um, <laughs> um, one of the things that somebody was asking is, could can you explain a little bit more about what you mean by Pueblito or Pueblito-like type? You know, some, some of us out here are not as familiar with um, uh, Navajo archaeology. Um, well, I, my understanding is that Pueblitos, um, I mean, there's been a lot, been um, some recent research by Townsend on Pueblito sites, but they're, you know, Navajo built. They're built in um, Northwest New Mexico mm -hmm. in the Neta area. Mm -hmm. And they're mm -hmm. one of the earliest examples of, I guess, Navajo architecture, but they're also the theory has always been that they were built with um, when uh, there, the Pueblo revolt happened in 1680. And when the Spaniards came back to reconquer the Pueblos uh, of New Mexico, um, then, the, then um, some of the Pueblo people or refugees ran, or went to live with Navajo people and um, that's where I guess the, the theory is that Navajo acquired, you know, a, a lot of um, Pueblo cultural a a attributes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'm, you know, they date to um, the 1700s, but I think Townsend has been doing a lot of recent research on Pueblitos and they're, they're built on very defensive mm -hmm. sites and they're usually um, associated with fork stick togans. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, I think his theory is that they're also, they're, they were mostly built be because mo more so because they were um, uh, at this time warring or raiding against um, command or protection against raids from Comanches and the Utes. And so I think there's different perspectives on. Cool. On yeah, I've seen some of those um, Pueblitos in the Dinita. They're pretty impressive and they're pretty like right on the edge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they're, they're not like Hogan shaped. They're not like round like a Hogan. They're, they're more um, almost like a tower, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Built usually of sandstone on very defensive, defensive high hard to reach areas. So, I mean, this is not my, you know, I, I'm, um, I study Navajo boarding schools. So, you know, if I mess this up, I'm probably gonna get yelled at by, <laughs> by some well, of my colleagues. Oh, it's all good. We're all learning. We're all learning from yeah. each other out and there. There's I'm a lot of your colleagues on listening and watching, but nobody's been yelling yet. They've all been very, very, <laughs> very, very appreciative. So. <laughs> so so we actually did go visit an actual Pueblito site at Chaco. Um, there are actually Pueblitos on Chakra, but we this what we were supposed to reevaluate this one, but it's so remote. We couldn't we could hike to it before the water rose, but after the water rose, we tried to get to it one day and it took us eight hours of serious four-wheel driving to get oh. so that we could hike to it, and that was just not gonna work. So yeah. um anyway, yeah. it's but the, the, I mean, the upside of site, these sites being so remote like this is that they're very well protected, you know. Um, mm -hmm. so, but yeah, there's apparently a whole string of Pueblitos going down Chakra, and a lot of them are on Navajo Nation land. This is what I've heard from colleagues like Pete McKenna and Tom Wines. Um, and that would be a fascinating thing to, to study. Yeah. I've got a bunch of questions. People want you to explain a little bit more about what is a double Hogan. Is I've got lots of folk asking. Yeah, well, I mean, they're they're it's like a, it almost looks like um, a figure eight. It's it's like you know the you can see the on the ground the stone shape um, in a circle, the sandstone, mm -hmm. and and there are two of them that are together. And sometimes you can't really tell where the doorway is because the stone has fallen in. 
but on some of them you can tell that there is a doorway between the two hogans so they're connected and brugi think i mean he says that you know a lot of these hogans were like single family units and so it's interesting that there are two you know two hogans together so i mean i the more research needs to be done on this um, but probably more information probably would be coming forth through oral tradition mm -hmm. rather than archaeological excavation about, you know, the significance of double hogans and, you know, who lived together. I'm pretty much guessing that it's, it was matrilineal because we are matrilineal and, you know, um, it could be, you know, a mother and her daughter mm -hmm. like that because that's, you know, traditionally, that's how the Navajo people, um, the, the daughters lived with, they're in close proximity to the, the mothers, and we were the ones that owned the, the hogan and the land. Mm -hmm. So it was the husbands that would move into um, the wife's community and wife's family. Hmm. Okay, thank you, thank you. Well, I want to ask one more question. Um, you've had a lot of people were really appreciated the story about the handprint and um, the red hands and stuff. And there's a question that the handprint and clan connection is amazing. Any plans for the park to have more Diné archaeology done or further public education and representation of Navajo people in the park? I mean, can either of you address that a little bit? I mean, I think Davina wants to address it. I'll just say I'm glad someone brought this up because that's kind of our biggest takeaway after our project. We think the park absolutely should do this. Mm -hmm. Go for it, Davina. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's something that, you know, um, is silenced in the park. Um, it, mm -hmm. there, there isn't, I mean, there's definitely Navajo archaeology. There's or evidence of Navajos living in Chaco on Charca Mesa. It was everywhere. It was very apparent. There's these old hogans that have been there for you know hundreds of years. There's all of this rock art, and you know it's very rich. Um, and you know I just I just wish that you know that that history would come out more and you know, be shared with the public because, I mean, I always knew that there were Navajo people in Chaco Canyon, but I never really learned about it. And um, I, hmm. I just assumed that there was a few Hogans in Chaco Canyon. No, there's so many Hogans. There's so, there's, there's so much evidence of them living there just as much as the ancient sites. Mm -hmm. And so I just don't, you know, I, I, I feel like the Navajo people, um, their history also needs to be represented in the interpretations that are done at, at Chaco, um, you know, yeah. as well. And, and it, would be, it would be really easy if the park is thinking about developing more interpretive trails to do an interpretive trail up on Chakra and visit some of these sites. And it could be really educational for people to see some of these sites within a small area, as we were saying earlier, you could see you know, a whole sequence of sites dating from like 1600s all the way up until 1950. So um, the, the possibilities for interpretation are, are there. And, and it would yeah. happen. And also the families are still there that mm -hmm. yeah and mm -hmm. that and that's another thing that we were talking about i think we're going to recommend in our report right that it would be nice to be able for the families to be able to go back and visit their places mm -hmm. or for yeah. even work to collaborate with them you know um, yeah. in the management or or just you know consulting them as well to to ask their permission to, you know, develop any kind of um, interpretation or any, you know, trails or something at these, these sites, because they're, they're still there in the area, they still live there. Well, let's hope we can see that happening here in future years. That'd be great. But we're going to recommend it. We'll see what they do. <laughs> Good. Well, I promised you I'd keep this to an hour because y'all, it's late at night. Bill, do you want to come back at all and wrap it up? You can pop in here real quick. And yeah. 
our two speakers for having so much energy three time zones away. Um, great job. And uh, thank you for um, sharing, a, obviously, an amazing partnership and a learning process and, and sharing it with uh, a big crowd on, on uh, tonight's talk. And just a, a quick note that um, we are opening um, the cafe series with the, <clears throat> this focus on Diné archaeology. And we're going to finish uh, all the way in May with Wade Campbell on uh, his presentation. There we'll be uh, collaborating with the next communities. So uh, we're <clears throat> going to come back to this topic. And uh, But on <clears throat> November 1st is the next cafe. And we're going to have two individuals who are participants in the Ancestral Lands Program. Um, and uh, the opportunities they get to connect to um, <clears throat> heritage in the kinds of work that they do through that program. And I will definitely learn how to pronounce their names properly by November 1st, <laughs> but I will try them tonight. Um, Kevin Kuyate and James Thol. Um, and big apologies if I messed that up. And thank you so much to Bina and Ruth. We knew you would have a good time and we all had a good time with you. Yeah, thank you so and much. Thank Thanks you. for having Thanks. us. Thanks. Sleep Thanks. well. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you.